Okay. All right. Let's uh, welcome our next speaker, Mr. Fator. He'll be talking about population movement profiles for scalable statistical inference from labeled mobile network data. Yes. Uh, hello, hello. Rather long and specific title for this presentation that I uh, hope to make uh, some sense of at least, but like to just get us down on our own. Uh, this is about mobile data. It's about uh, like metadata that's collected uh, from antennas. You know, whenever uh, mobile phones are like in some kind of like uh, connection with them. And uh, label here means just that we do very few or actually no like uh, spatial uh, assumptions on like the locations of antennas and whatnot and like some cool stuff we can do anyways with that. Uh, so that's what I'll be talking about. Uh, in overview then, uh, this talk will have uh, four parts. Uh, we'll go into what is exactly like this mobile network probing data, what kind of information can you expect to find in it, uh, and uh, reasons why it's collected and how it's being used and whatnot. Uh, the second part then is uh, we're gonna define uh, trajectories and co-trajectories in this uh, like antenna space kind of thing. So we can like actually follow devices uh, in some way or another. Uh, when that's done, we're gonna look at metrics between trajectories and co-trajectories. So it's like just a way of uh, measuring differences and distances between them. And, uh, how we do that when we don't make actual spatial assumptions, we can't use the regular equilibrium distances. distances. Yeah. And uh, lastly, since this work has been working with like very large data sets up to like uh, 60, 70, 80 terabytes, uh, there has also been a major component which has had to do with actually building infrastructure to be able to analyze and uh, ingest this data to even begin with. So let's begin with the mobile network probing data. So, you know, we all have mobile devices. Sometimes it's, there are phones, sometimes there are routers in our homes, and sometimes they're like Wi-Fi devices that are on buses and whatnot. So it's, it's not necessarily like a one-to-one -one thing between like a, a person, so to say, but more so devices. And um, what happens then is these devices do interactions with like all these antennas that we either see on the housetops or on the big uh, like uh, spots outside in the countryside or whatnot. And there are a number of different interactions that can happen. You have calls, messages, antenna handovers, for example, when you're roaming and you're switching between networks, and just data transfers of like regular uploads and downloads and whatnot. And all of this is uh, collected by the mobile operators as like fields of metadata that's, well, for their intensive purposes, used for billing and you know technical stuff. And to show like a mock example of, uh, so this is not real data, but it's like, you know, it can look like this or so. Uh, you'll have like dates, times of interruptions, some kind of IDs, like which device did this, a bunch of labels that usually like represents uh, like some kind of antenna area within a sub area, within a sub area, because like the whole country is divided into these. Uh, we've got this support. And then usually you'll have like 30 more columns of various informations compared to, for example, like download and upload volume. So it's like a when, who did it, where, or um, how much kind of things. 
So like, what's the use of this data? Uh, like, because you kind of get a large overview of like how the population moves overall. So it's can be used for city planning, for uh, roads and public transports, and also like just for research, uh, for example, uh, how a population might like, be affected and change their behavior in response to, for example, COVID restrictions and whatnot. So you can do pretty like large scale population statistics. Like so. Uh, so, uh, you know, first question I'd like, if you have a device, where's the device? Okay, physically, it's right there. We have some antennas that picks it up, but from our point of view, we of course don't see this. We just see the antennas. So then the question is like, where is the device now then? And to like, what degree can you actually accurately pinpoint something because you know we're not talking about gps who, which has like a very fine uh, spatial discretization uh, so we have to do like some assumptions based on like the locations of these these things which has picked up a signal uh, and there's been a plenty of variations of this that's been developed through like the years like triangulations go with the nearest antenna were on our cells and rings and like different like distributed trajectories and uh, like, like kind of like statistical uh, solutions to this problem. And each of these makes their own assumptions about the space and has their own like uh, margins of errors and so on. Uh, but we don't even make that assumptions for this one. Because a lot of times you might have a location for the antenna and you use those locations to infer the location of the device. But what if you don't even have that? Like say that for these antennas, you only have like some abstract labelings of like different sectors and whatnot. You don't even have the map of like, where is this like in a longitude and latitude sense? So, the question becomes like, if you're restricted in this way, what can you still like do? Kind of thing. Yeah, so if we only use the network data, yeah, show that we can still like build up like some kind of trajectories, we can define a very simple uh, symmetric set difference metric on it, create movement and data profiles which show like uh, large scale population changes and like also compare and co com compare trajectories and co trajectories. So uh, now we're going to some definitions here on like some mathematical definitions of trajectories and co trajectories. Uh, and a lot of this is built upon uh, the work by Yul Dani in 2019. Uh, privacy and analysis of trajectories and co trajectories. So we begin by saying that you have some set of locations, um, you know, very abstract. It can be these foreign rings, these uh, antenna locations, or just labels in this case. Uh, now we define a data point as a pair xt, where x is some location and t is then is our timestamp. So a place and a time that we've collected the data. Uh, we denote the set of all possible data points by d. And then a trajectory then is given by a set of these data points, which has to satisfy certain properties one is that uh, no two data points can have the same timestamps. So we don't allow like data to like infer on the exact same time. And between any two like intervals, we don't allow like an infinite amount of uh, timestamps. So this makes this trajectory definition like a fundamentally discrete one. It's not like the 
trajectories or paths you would think of like in the, in the example of a particle in space and all that. Uh, so very simply then uh, an example trajectory is one that I usually take the train from Stockholm to Uppsala, go to that territory and then have the bus taken somewhere else. And, and this is more akin of like a GPS trajectory, of course. Uh, but if we have instead like a set of antennas, you know, we'll more have a kind of a sweeping uh, trajectory where like as we go on, like our signal is pinned back and forth and can sometimes quite, like get picked up by antennas pretty far away. So we'll have more of a broad stroke kind of trajectory going on. Um, so with that in mind, we take it one step further. We will denote, denote the set of all trajectories by, by T and define a co-trajectory R of N trajectories as this multi-set of trajectories. So a co-trajectory is just simply like any collection of uh, trajectories seen together. Um, so like we could pick this one, that one, and that one and call those like a co-trajectory. And it's kind of like a, you know, a population sampling in, in a sense. And the, the picture gets pretty like complicated quickly if I would try to like map out the antenna wise version of this one. Uh, but the idea stays the same. Um, so, so that's like the abstract definition and to make it more like, uh, you know, exactly what are our locations when we're working with like this labeled antenna data. Um, so what we have is there is like a set of antennas uh, where each antenna for our specific data is a set of five like integers uh, structured in a way that like the first represents a large area, the second represents a small area, and they're kind of divided up between different like networking technologies like 3G, 4G, and so on. Um, and furthermore, another restriction we have is that our time stamps are not like continuous in that way, but instead disparate in size by five minute intervals. So with uh, these two like restrictions in mind, if we have like a data point on, on this antenna at 91 and another data point of another antenna at 93, in our like version of, of these definitions, these would necessarily have to collapse into a set of antenna points at this discretized time instead. Uh, which means that our set of locations then you know, becomes the power set of all like the antennas that we have. Um, so those were like mathematical definitions of uh, trajectories and co trajectories. And uh, I'll talk about like, okay, so if you only have data points with like some random labelings of parts, can we still find some interesting way to compare them? And uh, actually, you just take one of the simplest comparisons you could think about when you are talking about like sets of subsets and whatnot. And uh, that is the uh, symmetric set difference in this case. Um, because like if you have uh, two data points with, with overlapping subsets, we see them as the same position on the sets Overlap less, uh, we get more of a distance in this case, and when they're completely separated, we have quite a distance. Um, and that works, you know, if you have two trajectories, then in this antenna space, and they diverge. You know, doesn't matter if uh, 
one is in Malme and the other one is in Aparanda, like they'll have the same value as if they have just been separated by a town or a So uh, I define then like uh, the like distance between two trajectories as the sum of all the like, locations then for the first trajectory and the second trajectory of like each like uh, equal time stamp. Uh, and I also choose to like have some kind of normalizing constantity to keep it between zero and one. And using this metric, I get some interesting results. Like for example, uh, I'm able to define some kind of movement profile uh, where I take one trajectory and I take the net, like the distance from it to a time shifted version of itself. So here, for example, I have some uh, <clears throat> example profiles taken from a early February, Thursday, 2001. These are real devices, um, which could like, for example, uh, represent a commute hour uh, up at six in the morning and go home around 16, 17. Um, here we have a high activity during the night, which like represents like a night shift worker, for example, uh, spikes of movement and some constant like, um, you know, of course, seeing as we're following devices, I can't necessarily say that this is this the person on like the bus or a device that's attached to the bus, but details, details. Um, and then so the movement profile is uh, even zero. Is there moving? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if if it's a uh, spike of one, that means that the previous like set of antenna labels has completely dis been disjointed from their next time step. This is five minutes, right? so every, every yeah. other five minutes will go away. Yes, so that's that's why I compare it with like a time shift version, so because it just says like, have you moved in this next five minutes compared to where you were before? So like profile three is moving all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This this one is in like constant movement throughout the whole. Okay. Um, so I'm not driving the truck all the way for the two. For example, for example. So yeah, uh, this data is uh, like a couple hundred of thousands of different trajectories. So it's a pretty substantial like sample of the Swedish population. Um, and. Here I've just taken out like four representative ones for the show. Um, and so when we have all these like individual movement profiles, uh, you know, the next question could come to like, okay, how what if we aggregate them then for like just the whole population instead? Um, and like in this case, I I choose like a co-trajectory, which is just like every single uh, trajectory. Now you could of course do more like fine tuned selections of like maybe you want to compare different like cities instead or different income levels and whatnot. Uh, the problem of course is since we don't know the locations of the antennas in this case, we necessarily don't even know the cities without doing an extra like spatial uh, like projection. So you kind of have to keep very coarse grained at the moment. But if we just choose like the whole population for now, and uh, like we sum up all, every single individual movement profile, uh, divide by, like we take the mean of it, we, we 
for the same Thursday then, this, this graph here shows us like the mean of like movements of like this half a million to 300, 400,000 trajectories of devices in Sweden. And you know, it follows some kind of common sense pattern. We have very low like movement up until like four or five, where it quickly spikes into the morning commute hours for this, dies down a little bit, um, and you know, keeps rising up until lunch hour. And then as people you know, progressively start quitting work and going home, we finally like reach a top of here that then like declines as the uh, evening comes closer. It's not showing us much new, but it's pretty cool to see for like that substantial amount of people overall. Um, okay. Uh, is this for real data? Yeah, yeah. This is bona uh, fide real data. So I don't know what happened. <laughs> Uh, sorry. Yeah. I was thinking of the back of slide. Something happened. Okay, we'll go. Uh, I'm back again. Yeah. Right. So uh, imagine this like movement profile, but we looked at it, at it from above instead. And we colored like the height by like various shades and we get like more of a heat map profile where we have from uh, five in the morning to 10. So, you know, catching just before their rush hours and towards the peak of things. And so each line here, like represents a uh, like movement profile. And if they have been collected from uh, 2019 to 2022, so, uh, you know, Thursdays and whatnot. And so, like what you'll see here, for example, the very dark lines are uh, almost always like right after Christmas, right after New Year's. So what you'll have is like a sudden dip in movement in the early hours because people stay home, they have holidays and whatnot. You'll have pretty strong bands uh, of change, which here represents like the switch from uh, winter to summer clocks. And besides that, you'll have more like big uh, like changes. Is that the corona effect? 2020 or two yeah. Uh, so. I'm trying to I'm trying to I was trying to see that from the graph, but I think I would need to uh, load in a, a bit more hours. Yeah. And probably a bit, a bit more like fine course to like see that like and probably also like shift them so that the changes of like summer clocks and whatnot doesn't uh Rina says the sharing has stopped somehow. Oh. Uh yeah. Now I can see it. Now it works. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Cool, cool. Uh yeah, I think we're still recording. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, first. Okay. Um. <laughs> yeah, do you have us there? Oh. Yeah. Thank you. So you bought 15 minutes left. Cool. Uh, and you have bands for like, you know, the summer holidays and whatnot. So it gives kind of like a view of the changes over time. Uh, also, like, uh, this was a bit last minute. So it needs like some extra work, just this part. But, you know, kind of defining the same uh, you know, distance between co directors instead as like taking like a slice of uh, all times for the co-directories and like then comparing like the subsets. 
Um, and I had time to run a couple experiments, like comparing like, um, like Saturdays to Tuesdays and kind of getting some vague difference here, but with just like four samples, it's, it's not enough to really uh, show that much. Um, so this one needs to get a bit bigger, uh, but working on that. And also doing like a small like um, a permutation test between two different Thursdays to see like if the trajectories are like generated from the same uh, uh, underlying distribution. And uh, the uh, observed value was actually higher than all like the permutation values. Uh, I haven't printed it on this graph, but it was like 0 0.2 instead of the 0 0.9 ones, but um, still have some work there to make it really rigorous. Yeah, so there is a difference between the two Thursdays that you chose as the conclusion of the permutation test? Um, or is this between a Saturday and Thursday? This was between two Thursdays, one week apart. Okay. Um, and, uh, oh, uh, these slides show uh, another like profile of like data usage and whatnot. Uh, so instead of movement here, you have different spikes of download and uploads for individual devices. And in the same way, an aggregated like uh, download and upload amounts for like the whole subpopulation here, um, starting low, peaking towards like the late hours when, when people are home at leisure, so downloading pretty plenty amounts of data. Let's see. Um, and. This here is also is a movement profile, but split up by classes of data usage. So you'll have like devices that use a low amount of data seem to be less mobile than the devices that use the most amount of data, which might be explained by like, as you're traveling, you're automatically coming in contact with more antennas and automatically like having more uh, like interactions with them, which could cause like downloads and other things. But last part uh, before my time runs out. Um, so uh, quickly then about like just infrastructure and uh, some of the stuff that went into it. Um, so to facilitate like both, you know, just the small in investigations and like toying around with the data that, that I perform, you know, uh, this has mainly also been part to create a working computer cluster that can be used for research purposes uh, here in Uppsala. And uh, specifically then for like the uh, Callista research team at Economicum. Um, so, that's a major part of getting this whole thing up and going and working together. Uh, and so what we have all in all is 10 elite desk, desktop PCs you know, with some Intel Core i7 processors all running Ubuntu Server 22 for long-term support and together sporting roughly 80 terabytes worth of like permanent storage in the form of like uh, you know, internal SSDs and external hard drives that are connected to it. So it's a, it's a sizable, it's a sizable cluster. Um, they're all communicating via a high performance Cisco RV345 router, usually like a small business, small office kind of, device which is then connected to a like 
secured uh, data source where like this mobile phone data is uh, is housed uh, more permanently. Um, some nice pictures of the thing. We have six on top of the desks, some more hidden under. Um, I, I didn't know what the router was when I started this. I've learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, show what you almost can see behind here is like a bunch of extra like Intel Nooks mini computers that you know, eventually will be will be integrated. We just ran out of Ethernet cables to connect them with for the moment, but uh, it's, it's working pretty well as is. Um, the I've set up the cluster from scratch. Um, you know, installing new operating systems on them, setting up all the services. Uh, I use uh, Ansible for uh, like provisioning of the cluster. So, like if I get a new node, installing it is a matter of like one click and about five minutes to download everything, install everything, and then like automatically partition out like all the new config files that needs to be made. So uh, removing, inserting a computer, no issue at all. Um, it has been set up with the uh, Hadoop uh, distributed file system, uh, which means that uh, the data sources are like evenly shared between all computers. So, you don't have like a, something that fills up and then next things fill up and next things fill up. But it's distributed and through this system, you can interface with it as if it was like one single enormous 80 terabyte hard drive in a fairly simple way. Um, it's also running Apache Spark um, as its analytics engine where like all the querying, ingestion, and like actual data processing is, uh, is handled. And on top of that uh, is also running uh, a very modern service called De Delta Lake, which is like an extension of Parquet files, which uh, is like the format that we save all process data in for like very fast uh, retrieval and uh, querying and whatnot. Um, so some ideas of like the sizes that we're dealing with. Um, so the records that we're like ingesting in from this permanent data storage, you know, they are split by the hour. Each hour has uh, is roughly half a gigabyte in size. You know, so per day, we were talking about 12 to up to 15 gigabytes, depending. And um, each day in itself have uh, many, up to billions of rows. And somewhat capped by certain like internet cables and whatnot, but the process of like uh, finding the right files uh, taking them over the network, uh, you know, splitting it up into your like bespoke data types, uh, saving them as you know, delta tables, and distributing them over all computers for one day out of twelve gigabytes takes roughly eight to fifteen minutes, uh, depending on. Uh, so ingesting a week's worth of data and having it ready to work with, you'll have to hit a button and leave for lunch and then be back. But once it has been ingested though and stored in, in like in the Delta Lake format, actually like querying or sorting or like getting this data, and you know we're talking like billions of rows here, takes only seconds. So the bottleneck is getting the data into the cluster, but after that, you can do whatever like investigations you want on it, like very fast. 
and uh, in the interest of time, uh, I will uh, uh, give some thanks to my supervisor, Asish, my colleague, Marina Toder, the cultural geography department, and uh, my family and friends. And mom, that's watching. Okay, very good. We have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, I was thinking, so you define some distance metric using like how many antennas, like the number of antennas you in range and so on. So how much, uh, how many, like do you find that the number of set, the number of antennas are enough? Are they, are there a lot of them in Uppsala and other places or? Yeah, you... so, as, as long as we keep within like uh, major metropolitan areas, the uh, like fineness of the maps are pretty decent. Uh, you'll you ha actually have like a lot of antennas you know hidden on different rooftops and whatnot they are called inside the city center. So you can you can get like pretty like up to 100 to 300 meters ish. Kind of distance, which is not absolutely not the same like preciseness as uh, GPS tracking, uh, but like you have to aim your research questions uh, so they that they actually work with like the coarseness of the data. It is uh, not good as soon as you go rural, yeah, uh, and uh, especially you know further north where large areas are serviced by very few antennas you are talking about like several square kilometers of like areas of margin um, so how long reaches do they usually have these uh, um, okay I, I i don't have an exact number but it depends on of course the the technology and it's like a constant development thing as uh, mm. like the antennas themselves might have pretty long ranges, but the provider can like choose to limit them in certain ways. Uh, Shoot them off. Not my expert. Are there any questions from Zoom? Or... Well, just one question. You said that this was actual data, this movement profile. Yeah. How do you get it? <laughs> uh, it's. Uh, I haven't gotten the data personally. It is. Uh, you the... can't say too much about no. it. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if Marina can say anything. Yeah. You said something about. Uh... You said yeah, something... I mean, that helps. I could say something about this. So we got the data from one of the major providers in Sweden under the condition that is locally stored at our department and that we use it for research only purposes. And if we develop anything monetizable, then it can be negotiated. But until now, what we're doing is research basically. And we got the data from 2017 until now and still recording and growing. The company has between 10 and 15% uh, penetration of the market of in Sweden. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so like what you would normally do when you have these main amounts of data is that you would kick it away to like some cloud provider and forget about all the technical details. But you know, because sometimes you have legal limitations or contract limitations, and that's why you know, poor son like me have to build a cluster to <laughs> to make it work. You know. Um, like local instead. So was building cluster more difficult than one of the more difficult map courses you've taken, or how would you compare the difficulty of learning? Um, to the hardest math course about equal, but uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, no. Uh, I, I, I guess I guess my question is is pure mathematical education uh, uh, the training for building 
building on premise boxes. Let's let's see. Okay, so I mean, yes, of course, of course. <laughs> that's that's the that's the correct answer. <laughs> If there are no other questions, then uh... I have one more question. So, uh, you spoke something about like other ways of uh, doing this distances, distances or something, yeah, uh, and like assumptions of space. Like, what uh, what kind of assumptions would one like this make? Uh, right. So, the data we have is like which antenna did this, and that's just like a bunch of like ABC, right? doesn't say where the antenna is like located. So you need to have like the extra information of like ABC actually mapped to like, you know, longitude 51, latitude 61, something like so. And if you can do that, then suddenly, you know, you just th throw away the labels and go like, well, this is just like, like the long latitude, right? Uh, but, you know, if the antenna is here, the device, could be anywhere because we don't measure the device, we just measure the antenna signal, so to say. So the spatial assumptions is basically like what extra things do you have to add to say, like, well, where about is the actual device that connected to this antenna and not just the antenna? And then you have to, you know, because that device might connect to several antennas at the same time. Where and then you get like oh you do triangulations or you do like some cell integrates. Those are the extra like spatial assumptions that you make of like device location. You have any question, Marina? Anyone else? Zoom. No, but I could add to what uh, Christopher just said that we actually compare GPS trajectories to the antennas uh, locations in another paper. And what we actually saw was that a uh, very large percent of locations are not within the Voronoi polygon of antenna. So it's not that simple to just say, okay, the X, Y of the antenna is actually the representing one. And Christopher and Raj were discussing that, and they decided to go for the minimalistic information that is actually for sure there. And what does that tell? As opposed to like some kind of calculated location with a lot of assumptions behind. That's to the best of my understanding, guys. Yeah, exactly. So we want to work, we formally work with the, the actual signals provided by the antennas. I think we're getting kicked out. <laughs> so uh, let's thank Christopher again. Uh, so is the test is okay. the market is speaking or when or when it's